I'm always thankful for musicians in worship, but there's something special about that during the Advent season, to have our musicians, our choir members, our handbell ringers to participate and lead us in worship and recall the memories of Christ's first coming. This morning, before we turn to God in prayer, we're going to have a, uh, we're going to have a report. Many of you are aware, we've announced before, that our church is joining Kids Hope USA to form a mentoring relationship with students at Johnson Elementary School. I'm thankful this morning that Kim Kreischeld is here with us. Kim is a member at Faith Church in Highland, our sister church just down the road. And she has been working with Kids Hope for how many years, Kim? For about 10 years she's been working with Kids Hope USA. She has some experience and she is willing to work with us to help establish that relationship at Johnston Elementary. And Kim's going to come forward and share a report on what we're looking for as we begin this uh, new ministry at our church. Kim, welcome this morning. Thank you very much for having me here today. I love this program and I love to share this program with anyone who will listen. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, as Pastor Bill said, my name is Kim Kreischeld. I have been working with Kids Hope USA, helping at-risk children in the school system for many years. And you ask, what is at-risk kids? They're basically kids that just need to be loved on. Um, for this volunteer opportunity, you don't need any special training, you don't need any special schooling, you don't need any, uh, you know, degrees in anything, but uh, just generally how to love a child. And uh, we will be doing a get together on Saturday, January 15, just to share the program, to kind of go over the do's and don'ts of the program. But we're excited to go ahead and and be with Johnston School. It is right behind Plaza Lanes, as I saw on the Google Maps. So it's right here in Highland. We're helping our own children in our own community. And it's just an exciting opportunity. So what is Kids Hope all about? What kind of people do we need? So we're looking for mentors. Those people would be sharing one hour of your week with a child at Johnston. We meet during their lunch hour, and uh, then they don't go out for recess. They stay with you. Um, they love to play games, you know, Uno, Skippo, those kind of things. So it's a pretty relaxed and chilled out day. Those kids will come to you. Um, I'm sure that you are more than welcome to have the lunch out of the cafeteria if you'd like to share a meal with them, but uh, you can also bring your own lunch. But they, we just spend that time with them. They're kids that just need love, and what child doesn't need love? So that's our first opportunity for you to serve, is to be a mentor in the school. Our second opportunity to serve is a prayer partner. So these children just need prayer, as do all children. So we would ask that we could have some prayer partners in order to go ahead and, and set up the mentoring cup pair, the child and the mentor, and then you can just pray from anywhere you're at. So if you work or if you're not able to get out on a regular basis, especially in the winter, we can pray anywhere. And so we're also looking for prayer partners uh, for Kids Hope. The last opportunity you can help serve is um, we are very COVID friendly and of course in the school it's imperative that we're COVID friendly. We don't want to put ourselves or our students or anyone at the, at the school at risk. So um, we have come up with the boxes. They're just shoe boxes, but they have games, they have crafts, we have pens and pencils, scissors, dry erase boards. So we will also have a list, a complete list of items that you can go ahead and donate so we can get the kids program off the ground. Um, as you know, it, it is uh, financially something that you can do, then we would love to have you help in that way. So everyone sitting in the sanctuary is able to help in one matter or another. And so we're just excited to get the whole congregation just excited about the program and get involved in the program. Um, Pastor Bill has my information or Lori Hofstra has access to me 
If uh, anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them for you. Um, or Pastor Bill, I know, has been involved in the program at his previous church, so he also has that information. But the sign-up sheet is in the Welcome Center, and I'll be back there to answer any questions for you after the service if you have them. So welcome to this exciting adventure. I can't wait to get you guys started. So one quick story before I leave, because that always is kind of the clincher. So I did the Kids Hope program in Lansing when we were at our church at Bethel uh, Christian Reformed Church many years ago. And my student came in in his pajamas. And I thought to myself, well, it wasn't pajama day because I didn't see everybody else in the pajamas. So I just said to him, so, you know, why the pajamas? What, what happened last night? Did you, you know, oversleep and almost miss the bus? And he said, no, he said, the police raided my house last night. And so I didn't get to be at home to get dressed in my pajamas, out of my pajamas. And my heart was just sank because I thought to myself, no, here is a child that I had access to for actually, this was my second year with that child. And I had no idea what was going on in his life behind the scenes. All I knew was that the people in the school had, you know, had set him aside as an at-risk student. So we're just there to give love and compassion and just have the child know that we care about them. Because he said to me, you know, you are the first person who's asked me why I was in my pajamas today. And I thought to myself, how sad. They're just kids. They're kids that need love. They're kids that need attention. So if you're willing to do that, we would love to have you involved in the program. And um, again, the sign-up sheets are in the back. So I hope to see you there. Thank you, Kim, for sharing with us the number of ways we can be involved. And uh, I want to make a point of clarification. A number of weeks ago, we had a sign-up sheet while our council was discerning whether or not this was a program we'd want to, uh, to join to see if we had enough interest. If you did sign up on that sign-up sheet, please sign up again. <laughs> because that was just to discern our level of interest and to move forward. We do have your name still, and if you don't sign up, you'll probably get a call from me personally asking you to sign up and where we can, where we can count on you. But uh, the sign-up sheet is specifically for people ready to come to training for being mentors. We're also looking for sign-ups right now for people who are willing to sign up to be prayer partners. So if you're signing up to be a prayer partner, just put prayer partner behind your name. And if you're ready to come to training, that's on January 15, beginning at 10 a.m. That's a Saturday. Uh, we'll have a time of training to prepare people to go into Johnson Elementary School. Hopefully we can start that uh, as soon as possible after the beginning of the new year. We're going to come to our God in prayer together this morning. I do have a couple of prayer updates. Uh, we've been praying for Bill McQuery. Bill is back with us in church this morning. We're so glad that you're with us and out of the hospital, Bill. So thank, praise God for his recovery to this point. Uh, Coralie Van Amstel. Uh, Suffered a fall a couple weeks ago. She is now at Park Place undergoing therapy, hoping to return home. And we're going to pray for Kathy Boonder this morning, too. Kathy is uh, at Symphony in Dyer, recovering and recuperating, also hoping to come home soon. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, we long for the comfort that can only come from Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that as we worship you today, you will remind us of your power even though, Lord, we may be in the midst of personal troubles or troubles in our lives that seem to go beyond our own households. Lord, we pray that by your power you will correct us when we wander in our walk with you. We pray that you will reassure us of your power and love when we wrestle with questions and doubts. Lord, we praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you for your power, and we are so grateful for the love that you have demonstrated for your people. And during this Advent season, we notice that love, Lord, in the coming of our Savior Jesus. Move in our hearts to worship and adore you and shape our thoughts so that we eagerly anticipate with a sense of hope your return. Lord, we thank you that you were at work to protect and to restore those who are hurting. Father, we pray for those who are continuing to recover from tornadoes in Kentucky. 
We ask, Father, that you would grant the resources and the supplies that are necessary and that you would grant a sense of comfort and peace to those who have suffered loss. Father, we pray for your hand of protection to be on those who will be traveling in the week ahead for the holidays. Father, we thank you for the opportunities that we have to to worship you, for the opportunities we have to gather with family members and friends. And Father, during this holiday season, we pray that those gatherings would be a reminder of the grace and the love that you have shown us. Father, work in our hearts that we as a church family may be effective in proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and that we may be effective in demonstrating and showing what your kingdom looks like. Father, this morning we thank you for Kim Kreischeld and for her willingness to join our church in, in support of starting this new ministry for Kids Hope USA. Father, we pray that you would bless those who are considering volunteering. Lord, provide the mentors and the prayer partners who are needed that we may move into Johnson Elementary School and that our church ministry, Lord, for your name's sake, would be a light that shows mercy and grace to those in need. Lead and guide this ministry, Lord Jesus, we pray. Father, we ask that you'd bless us so that in participating in your kingdom, we may be effective. And we thank you, Father, for our elders and deacons and for their leadership to make decisions to guide our ministries. Father, bless the offerings that are received today as we exit the sanctuary for the Ministry Opportunity Fund. Utilize those gifts, Lords, in a way that will advance your kingdom and show your mercy. And Father, we thank you that your hand of healing is evident in our lives. Lord, we pray for those who are in need of healing. We pray for Ari Sweats in his ongoing battle with cancer. Lord, bless him and encourage him. Lord, we thank you for the healing that you've provided. We thank you that Bill McQuarrie was able to return home from the hospital and that he's able to be with us this morning. Continue to grant him strength. Father, we thank you that Mark Hooksema's mom, Jerry, was able to come home from the hospital as well. Lord, give her strength and encourage her. Father, we pray for those who are continuing to recover. We lift Kathy Boonder before you at Symphony in Dyer. Father, give her strength that she may be able to return home and bless her husband June as well, Lord, as as they long to be together again. And Father, we pray for Coralie Van Amstel. She recovers from a recent fall at Park Place. Lord, encourage her and sustain her. Help her to experience the peace of knowing that you walk with her. And bless her family, Lord, as they make decisions for the best possible care that she can receive. Lord, we come to you with these requests. So thankful that you are a God who hears us. So thankful that you are a God who gives us strength. Lord, help us to have hope in you that we may experience the fullness of that strength. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
coming and it was coming now. So what did I do? I was 14. I didn't know what to do. And then, in walks Pop. He's got blankets and water and family. And he was doing what he always did, <laughs> saving me. And that night, he saved me. I invite you to take out your Bibles this morning. Let's turn in them to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40 is where you will find our text. And in most of the Bibles in the pews, that should be found on page 1119. Page 1119 in most of the pew Bibles is where you will find Isaiah chapter 40. Hear God's word from Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, and rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I say, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in the balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord, or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him, and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge, or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him... All the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told from the beginning? 
Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is the word of the Lord. It's hard to wait and be patient when you have an eagerness, but, but there are different kinds of patience and waiting. Uh, I remember, especially when my children were younger, there was something enjoyable about seeing an eagerness on Christmas morning. Have you seen it in children? Christmas morning, children wake up and they can't wait to unwrap gifts that are under the Christmas tree. And, and in my household, I took advantage of that eagerness for a little bit of fun and sport. I would make sure that even though the kids woke us up at five in the morning so that we could go unwrap presents, I made sure there were reasons and excuses in place to delay as long as possible just to see that eagerness grow. You know what I mean. Uh, first, I need my cup of coffee, and then I needed to finish breakfast, and then I needed to make sure the kitchen was clean. I never got more help cleaning the kitchen than I did on Christmas morning when gifts were waiting to be opened. I would have to shower, and finally, they would protest one time too many of how much longer do we have to wait, and it was then that we could finally open presents. It was fun to see their patience or lack of patience because they were eagerly expecting something good. But there are other times when our patience is tested and it's hard to wait, not because we're eager, but because we're exhausted. Sometimes our patience is tested because we've been enduring a trial or a hardship. And it's not that we are expecting something wonderful to come, we're just looking forward to the current dire circumstances to come to an end. That's the kind of patience and waiting that the people of Israel were experiencing in Isaiah 40. In Isaiah 40, there's a waiting, a kind of patience that is called for from God's people who are looking forward to the exile, their time away from the homeland, their time not experiencing God's favor to come to an end. And the message of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40 is a message that, that, that changes tone. It changes tone because it's no longer a, a message to people who don't realize or understand why God has been punishing them for their sin. But instead, this is a message that says, God is bringing you comfort. God gives you hope. And he wants to turn your waiting from the kind of impatience because you're exhausted to a kind of eagerness because you're looking forward to something wonderful. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God, is how this text begins. And it represents a kind of turning point in the book of Isaiah. A turning point that moves away from the tone of making people aware of their own guilt to a tone that helps people realize that they can have hope in a God that they trust in because he brings great comfort. God speaks gently to people who have been hurting. That's what's happening in Isaiah chapter 40. You know, there's, there's a common misunderstanding about the nature of God for people who turn to his word. 
Uh, that common misunderstanding is that in the Old Testament, we see a picture of a God who is harsh and full of wrath. We see wars, we see battles, we see judgment being declared. And that in the New Testament, through Jesus, we see a picture of God who is gentle and gracious and loving. And many people look at this and, and they characterize the Old and New Testament that way and they think uh, those have to be two different pictures. They're mutually exclusive. Can God really be that harsh and full of wrath in the Old Testament and so gentle and loving and comforting in the New Testament? But for people who have that kind of image, that caricature of two images of God, this text in Isaiah 40 helps give a more complete and more full picture. This text shows us that a God who has just finished declaring his judgment is also loving and powerful. You know, we have those two pictures of Jesus. When we think of the Advent season, there are two images. Advent is a time of looking backward. It means we remember Christ's first coming. But it's also a time of looking forward to, to Christ's return, to when his fullness, the fullness of his kingdom will be revealed and known. And when we look back, during the Advent season, we see pictures like the video clip we saw today. That mental image of Mary and Joseph coming to the inn. Mary ready to give birth. Joseph being a, a native of Bethlehem or having his family roots tied to Bethlehem had to return there for a census. And you know the story, don't you? It's a story that gives us rise to so many nativity scenes of, of a stable, of a manger, of animals, of shepherds and wise men all there at the same time in the picture. And that that happens at the end. And in that picture, we see an image of gentleness, don't we? We see Jesus as an infant, vulnerable, mild, who comes to humble circumstances. And it gives us a feeling of warmth to think of a, a new child coming into those kinds of realities. That's Advent. But Advent also means we look forward to the time when Jesus will come again. It means the reality of the book of Revelation. It means the reality of God's final judgment being declared. And when we think of the final picture of God's kingdom, we see Jesus being victorious. We see Jesus as the one who rules over all. There is an image of Christ where he is gentle and level and, and kind and so quaint in the manger scene. But the book of Revelation also gives us a picture of Christ who is powerful, of Christ who conquers, of Christ who declares judgment and pours out his wrath on those who have forsaken him and caused harm. It's a complete picture. It's a complete picture of a God who is powerful and loving. And it's a picture that Israel needed, and it's a picture that we need. Because in Isaiah chapter 40, the people of Israel have endured hardships. And we see how God speaks to these people. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. When we struggle for a long time, it's often difficult to see God's plan. Even if you are someone who knows Christ as your Savior, even if you're someone who has read God's Word, and in your head you realize God is always in control and I trust Him, there are moments when you're enduring hardship where you wonder, where is this leading? You may have questions. It's, it's, it's natural for humans who are, who are damaged and corrupted by sin, it's natural for us to not completely see the fullness of of God's, picture, of God's picture, of God's kingdom. And in those moments we struggle, there are a couple questions that may come to mind. We may wonder, is God really strong enough to overcome evil? Or if we don't believe that that's the problem, we may believe God is strong enough, we wonder, does God really care about me? Does God really care about my current concerns? In the midst of struggles, we may ask those kinds of questions. Why am I hurting? What is going on? What is God doing? God, do you really care about me? And for the people of Israel, for whom the first part of Isaiah is filled with these images that they have walked away from God, God brings a word of comfort in Isaiah chapter 40. Israel needs Isaiah. Israel needs Isaiah to give context to their suffering. Because without a prophet to speak a word, we, we know what the circumstances are. We know the hardships we endure. 
we struggle to understand why, and we struggle to understand what good can possibly come of this. And Isaiah says to the people, your suffering is coming to an end. The purpose for which God has been doing this is about to be fulfilled. The trials have not been for nothing. The trials are useful. The trials are going to do something in your lives that bring God's kingdom. Now, our trials can fit into a number of categories. And I think that as Christians, well, all people really, but especially as Christians, even if we understand that God has a purpose for everything, it's hard to understand the nature of any particular struggle that we go through. Sometimes when we're in the midst of a hardship, sometimes we, maybe that hardship is a health crisis. Maybe that hardship is, is tension in a relationship. Maybe that hardship is financial. We feel a sense of despair and we wonder, what is God doing in the midst of this? Sometimes those hardships are punishment. Sometimes we suffer because we've done something wrong and God is taking steps to correct what we've done wrong because we don't want to continue in the ways of doing things that are wrong. Sometimes our hardships are because someone else has done evil and it's landing on you. You're an innocent victim or a bystander, so to speak. It's not that you did something wrong to cause this, but evil in the world has been unleashed. Sometimes our hardships may not be someone punishing us as much as that's just the natural consequence when you do something foolish and now you're struggling with hardship. There are all of these and many more possibilities for why we struggle in any given moment. But whatever the reason that we struggle, Isaiah reminds us that none of those reasons can stop God's plans. God has built a design, and his design is to bless his people. Even when we suffer and we are being punished, even when God himself is reaching into our lives to take some kind of corrective step, we may feel as though God's against us, but God is working for our benefit. We might think that suffering is unfair. Maybe you understand when you're suffering because you're being punished. Maybe you can per say perfectly, well, you know what, I, I did wrong, I deserve that punishment. But then there are other moments when the suffering goes unexplained. When you don't know why you've been sick so long. When you don't understand why someone is trying to hurt you and someone is so upset with you. Maybe in those moments you say, well, Lord, why don't you take care of this? Are you really strong enough to handle this? Do you really care about my current concerns? It's hard to put consequences for evil into perspective because our actions have consequences beyond our own lives. Our actions sometimes, or the actions of anyone, can unleash sin, can unleash evil. Even there were people in Israel. Israel had been taken down a course where their days of their kingdom, the line of David, and the northern and southern kingdom, that was coming to an end sooner or later because of evil in the land. But what about the people who lived in Israel who were still trying to honor God? What about those people who refused to worship foreign gods? Even those people had to suffer as a result of evil that had occurred in the land. There are times that people suffer even when they haven't. We call that kind of a collective punishment. And I think we understand collective punishment sometimes, even though it seems unfair. How many of you were ever a student in, say, third grade? And your whole class had to stay in at recess because two-thirds of the class was talking during the lesson. Did you, ever, did you ever have that in your class? Not many. You were all the ones who were talking, weren't you? You were the ones who deserved to stay in. <laughs> That's my, We can understand, even if it never happened to you, can you understand that there might have been someone in class who was doing exactly what they were supposed to and they still had to suffer with everybody else? Have you ever been on a sports team? And you played the best game you could possibly play, but your teammates blew it and your, your team lost. Seems unfair, doesn't it? You did your part. You did what you were supposed to do. Why, doesn't, why don't things go well? But sometimes the actions of others affect you. Or maybe you were the one who you blew it. Maybe your actions for your company at work, it fell apart because you didn't fulfill your role. And there were many others at the company who paid a price because you made a poor decision. 
what I want us to realize is that our actions have consequences beyond our own lives. And when we experience hardships and trials, there are times we don't fully understand why we are suffering. And there are times that we have caused suffering that we don't fully grasp. And it's in those moments where things just don't seem fair. That's the reality of sin in our world. The reality of sin means that evil has been unleashed and it's not always perfectly just anymore. Sometimes the wicked get away without punishment and sometimes those who are innocent suffer in spite of their righteousness. And we can question, Lord, do you really care? Lord, are you really strong enough? And to those questions... God speaks. And God comes with power. In verse 10 of our text today, we see Isaiah responding to that potential question of, is God really strong enough to, to bring an end to this exile, to bring an end to these foreign armies that are, that are oppressing us? God, God says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10, see the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. This power of God means there's a reward and there's a recompense. That, that means there are wonderful gifts coming to those whom God favors, and there is a day of judgment to pay the piper for those who have walked away from God. It's a frightening image of God's power. But this power certainly means that God can overcome the day. And this power is evident in the book of Isaiah. If, if you have your Bibles open, I would encourage you to turn back to Isaiah 36 and 37. I'm not going to read this to you at this time, but I want to tell you about the story. And I'll, I'll encourage you to read through that story some other time on your own. In Isaiah 36 and 37, the city of Jerusalem is under siege. And Hezekiah, who is the king at that time, is being mocked and ridiculed by the armies of Assyria. The armies of Assyria are, are led by Sennacherib. He's the king at that time. And they come to the city and they say to the men on the wall who are watching, listen, you see the thousands and thousands of soldiers we have here. We can overtake you, but we'll offer you a deal. The deal is surrender yourself and we won't hurt you right now. And when the people of Israel refused to talk because they had been told not to talk, the Assyrian armies started mocking Israel started mocking the God of Israel. They said, your God isn't strong enough, or if your God is strong enough, he doesn't care enough about you. Hezekiah gets word of the mocking that is happening. And Hezekiah turns to God in prayer. And that night, as the Assyrian soldiers are scattered around the city, ready to lay siege to the city just on the word of their leader, an angel of the Lord goes through the camp of the Assyrian army. And puts to death 185,000 soldiers in the Assyrian camp. And the Assyrian armies go back home. The Assyrian armies mocked the one true God, and then they saw the power of God at work. Now the story doesn't end there. Once back home, the Assyrian armies returned home, and then their, their, their leader, Sennacherib, goes into the temple to worship his God. And I say God with a small g there. He goes into the temple, and while he's in the temple, he himself is killed with the sword. Do you see the irony there? As the Assyrian armies mocked the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and said, your God isn't powerful, your God doesn't care, when Sennacherib goes to the place where he worships his God, who he claims is more powerful, there his life is taken. Who's got power? It sure is clear to the people who are hearing the story, and it had to be clear to Hezekiah at that time, our God can take down the armies when it seems like we have no hope. Our God can turn a trying and tense situation into a great victory where we don't even have to put anything at risk. The God of Israel is powerful, which means the struggles of Israel are no accidents. The struggles of Israel aren't happening because God has fallen asleep or because God isn't able to do more. The struggles of Israel are not because Babylon or Assyria or any other nation was more powerful than the one true God. But that God who is powerful is also kind. 
He is not cruel. That power of God is balanced by his tenderness. And that tenderness is evident in the text we read where his God speaks a word of comfort to his people. As God speaks that the sin of the people has been paid for, that they've been forgiven. To forgive means that your, your offenses are cast aside. That means that the consequences of your actions have been lifted. But forgiveness is not cheap grace. God's tenderness brings good news to people who have heard a lot of bad news. The war is about to be done. Iniquity has been dealt with. They're rebellion and they've received double for all their sin. In other words, your account is clear. You no longer owe. You have paid the price for your sin. You see, exile dealt with the sins of Israel. The desolation that happened had leveled the field that the evil was no longer there and now they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to bring a fresh start. Now they were waiting for God's people to be restored. That's God's grace, that he restores people who have felt knocked down. We, we read last week of how God took an axe and he kind of leveled the forests. And then he starts again with a, a shoot that comes out of the old stump. Here we see another image of that, that, that your sin has been paid for, everything has been leveled, and God is about to start this new work. This grace that is not a free pass. This grace that God is starting over with is different than what we describe as forgiveness. It is comfort. It is strength. It is power. But it's, it's, it's grace in the midst of hardships that reminds us that God's plans have not been abandoned, even though a generation may have gone by. Because the cost of sin demands a high price. The cost of sin is not something that is easily just taken care of. You know, sometimes people who are naive, and I say that as all of us, at, all, at one point or another we're all naive. Naive just means we don't fully understand how things work. In naivety, sometimes we think problems are no big deal, that the person in charge can just take care of it. I remember when I was younger, hearing presidential elections and politicians talking about we're going to bring an end to hunger i thought that is great if i were president that's what i would do i would bring an end to hunger if i were president i would make sure that everybody had enough money if i were president i would make sure and they're, they're all great ideas aren't they that if you were president what could you get done I'm a little older now than I was in those presidential elections, and I've heard a lot of presidential candidates talking about what they want to do, and the failure has not always been because the politicians were deceptive. The failure is often because it's a lot harder to make things right than we realize. Have you ever had that experience in your own life? Have you ever in your life made a promise of, I'll take care of this, and then you realized, whoa, I, I just promised a whole lot more than I was able to do? Because it's a lot harder to take care of problems than we often realize. We tend to look at God and we say, God, if you are so powerful, why don't you just take care of sin? Just wipe it away. But the problem of sin runs deeper than we realize. And the price of sin is something that, that is difficult to, to pay and to set things right. You see, there's the issue of justice. The issue of justice of once we've sinned, we have to pay the penalty of that sin. And we understand that. If we borrow money, we have to pay it back. If we break something, we have to fix it. That's just justice. But there's also a matter of correcting the direction we're going. There are times that you can fix something that's gone wrong, but you haven't gotten to the root of the problem. You can fix a car that's been broken. Your car gets a flat tire, you fix the flat tire. But the problem is that you keep driving your car through these places where there are all these nails. You fix the tire, but did you really fix the problem? Sometimes you've got to drive your car in a new direction. Sometimes you've got to take your car to a new place so that those same old problems don't revisit. What God is doing to the people of Israel is he is not just setting things right, he is also correcting them so that they no longer walk away from him. The problem Israel had come into was that they'd worshipped other gods. 
God allowed the Babylonians, he allowed the Assyrians to come in and to take them captive. Part of that corrective measure was so that Israel would no longer walk away from God. The people of Israel had to learn. God could have wiped out the Babylonians right away. He could have taken out the Assyrians much sooner than when he did. But God was creating a new start. He was using his spirit to do something that required his powerful, his power. God was deserting his dominance here. God is making it clear to the people of Israel in, in Isaiah 40 that he is dominant, that he is in charge, and that he is going to take care of all things. Your suffering has not been for a, an inexcusable reason. God is setting things right, and he's going to take care of you. And in verse 27, we get an explanation for God asserting his dominance here. It says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disgraced by my God. There's this question of, if God's really powerful, why are we suffering? Why is God not caring for me? He's powerful enough. In Hezekiah, we saw that. In the story of Hezekiah and Sennacherib, God's power was there. But here's where we start to see this story of Christmas, that God does care, and we have reason to have hope. How much does God care? God cared so much that in Jesus, he entered the mess of this world. And on Christmas Day, this coming Saturday, we're going to gather together to worship at 9.30 because on Christmas Day, Jesus Christ, God Almighty in the flesh, in this ironic twist, came to us. And it's ironic because the God of all power and strength who could stop 195,000 men in an army enters circumstances that seem so humble and lowly. On Christmas Day, we remember the birth of a baby. Now, when babies are born, that's, that's cause for celebration, isn't it? When babies are born, you celebrate, you are glad. We love to see babies being born. And it becomes even greater celebrations, and more people celebrate when there is a baby who's born to a family of a noteworthy position. How many of you heard about royal families from across, from across the ocean when their children are born? How much news coverage that gets? We think of the children of celebrities and how much they are touted. But when Jesus, God in the flesh, arrived, he came in humility. And the reason he came in humility is that it shows us his love. It shows us how much he was willing to pay. It shows us that this great cost that sin has done is not a cheap, quick answer, but Jesus himself is willing to enter to take care of that. And when we know that, we start to have hope. When we know that God is powerful enough to take care of any struggle and that Jesus is willing because he loves us to enter our struggles, that's when we can have hope. And we are empowered by God to endure our trials. Whatever the reason for our trials, we can know that God is with us. Now, I want to be careful here. I don't want this to minimize our sin. And I don't want... The idea that God is always with us to become a reason that we give excuses for bad behavior. We can say God is powerful, God is with us, so he's going to take care of anything. And we sometimes neglect to confess our sin. We sometimes think that the actions that we're taking are fine because if we do something wrong, God will take care of it. God doesn't want his sovereignty and his power to become an excuse for our poor decisions. In fact, the corrective measures that he took in Isaiah that he took in the Old Testament, were because his people kept going astray. The tone of this text is not, it's easy to just let God take care of it. But the tone of this text is one that says, you can wait with hope, that your waiting, your patience, can be a kind of eager anticipation of something wonderful coming, rather than a kind of exhaustion. In Isaiah chapter 8, we see Isaiah being told that he had to wait. In Isaiah chapter 8, God gives the good news and he tells Isaiah, now you have to seal up the scrolls. We're not ready to read the answers yet. Seal up the scrolls and wait for the right time. Hezekiah has to wait. In Isaiah 36, he has to wait and pray without fighting as God takes care. But as people who see what God has done, we wait with hope. We wait with a sense that God is going to do what he has promised. We wait with optimism. 
because we are encouraged by God's promises. The hope we have is that the trials don't win. God has spoken. God has promised. God has reassured. And we see in the final verses, and I, I know there are times we think, you're not supposed to have a favorite verse of the Bible. And I'm not going to say this is my favorite verse, but I will say the end of this chapter is a verse that I've probably turned to and reflected on maybe more than any three or four verses in Scripture. This verse meant a lot to me going through some struggles and trials, going back to college. This is a verse I turn to over and over again. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. That tells us who God is. He is powerful, he is capable, and he has a plan that you can't possibly grasp. And then we get a picture of what it looks like to hope and what hope does to his people. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. We're all prone to stumbling and falling and to struggling at times. But this is what happened. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. There's a strength that's renewed when we trust in God. And what does that renewal look like? I love this image of renewal. That sometimes we feel like we are soaring on wings like eagles. Have you ever had a moment like that? A moment where it seems like God has done wonderful things in my life. A moment after a great victory. A moment after you're celebrating. A moment after your prayers have been answered and you are filled with gratitude to God and it feels like I'm on cloud nine. If you ever have said you're on cloud nine, you're soaring on wings like eagles. And sometimes God's hope gives us strength that we feel like we are soaring. But one of my pet peeves about how this verse is often used is that whenever I see this verse on a plaque, it stops right there. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, they will soar on wings like eagles. Boom, done. No, not done. Look a little further with me, please. Sometimes we feel like we're soaring on wings like eagles, but that's not the only way God's hope gives us strength. It goes on to say, we will run and not grow weary. Now, if you're able to run, that's a nice feeling. And if you're able to run with endurance, that's great. But it's not as easy as soaring, is it? When you're soaring, it feels like you're on cloud nine. When you're running, you're exerting effort, but it seems like I've got more than enough strength to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. It's not as easy, it's not as fun, but it's still wonderful. And if you're able to do that, if you have enough strength and more to to do what you're called to do, that's the strength of God's hope. But there's one more line. They will walk and not be faint. Soaring is great, running is wonderful, But have you ever had a day, or maybe a week, or a month, or a period of time where it's all you can do to put one foot in front of the other? That you're walking, you're not doing things quickly, you're not accomplishing things with ease, it's it's a struggle, and the hope that you have is that I'm able to take the next step. You're walking without fainting. Isaiah is letting us see here that the strength we gain from God's hope, the strength we gain from Jesus Christ, that, that strength can be soaring, it can be running, it can be just having enough to get through and endure. But in all of those moments, it is God's strength with us. A God who is powerful enough to do more than we ask, and a God who loves you enough that he's never going to leave you alone. You can trust in a God who has no equal. You can trust in a God like that. In those moments when you will wonder, Lord, how long will it be? Remember that Christ came. That he came and and he became like us in every way. You can remember that this God is powerful enough to be judge of the heavens and the earth. And he is caring enough that he knows exactly what your needs are. He will give you strength to endure. We are people who are eagerly waiting. And our waiting can turn from an exhaustion of trying to endure to an eager anticipation that God is bringing something good. He reassures us, he is shaping us so that his plans will be fulfilled. And when we wait for God, we can wait like kids at Christmas, knowing that there is something wonderful just around the corner. Will you bow your heads and join me in a word of prayer? Lord God, we thank you that we wait with an eager anticipation that we know and we can trust in you because you are powerful enough to conquer all things And you are loving enough to hear our requests and respond to our needs. Lord, renew our strength. 
give us a kind of hope that helps us to feel those moments of soaring, that gives us the kind of strength to run with the ability to do more than we need to, and help us to recognize, Lord, when you are giving us the strength just to put one foot in front of the other to endure the trials of the day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're able, let's stand together as we sing, What Child Is This? Receive God's parting blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. And all God's people said,